All right. Let's see where we're going first this morning. Mark chapter number eight. Mark chapter number eight. Second book in the New Testament, the book of Mark. Interesting thing about Mark is the fact that uh, Paul and Barnabas were going on one of their first missionary journeys and took uh, Mark with them. And uh, in the process of that, uh, he got discouraged, homesick, I don't know. But in the middle of the uh, journey, he had to go back home. And so he kind of quit in the middle of what was going on. And it was a reminder to Paul and Barnabas that sometimes everybody has times where they struggle and need a little bit of encouragement, motivation, or whatever the case may be. So they went on their, uh, John came back home, and uh, his name was John Mark, and uh, so he came back home. And uh, so they went over their missionary journeys and came back, and then they were getting ready to go again. And so uh, Paul said, well, let's gather the folks to go and, and visit the churches that we helped start and we're going along and, and uh, we'll do that. So he was talking with Barnabas at the time as they had Barnabas's, uh, the name means son of consolation and a very, very, very honorable and spiritual man. Scripture alludes to that on more than one occasion. And uh, Barnabas said, hey, I, I want to take my nephew, John, John Mark with us. And, uh, and Paul said, no. I don't want him to come. He's a quitter. He, uh, he, he quit in the middle of everything and went back home. I don't want to have to do that again. I, we need somebody that's going to stay on task and do what they're supposed to do. And scripture says that the, uh, the contention between Paul and Barnabas became so sharp that they, they just said, well, I want to take John Mark. I think he's beneficial. So Barnabas went on a missionary journey with John Mark. Paul at that time picked up Silas and they went on their second missionary journey. Interestingly enough, because of the investment that Barnabas had given and saw in John Mark, even though he quit the first time, look, everybody gets discouraged. Everybody has a point where they get a little bit down. They get a little bit discouraged. It seems like the, the cares and the affairs of this world begin to press on them somewhat. Whether it's financial, whether it's emotional or physical, whatever the case may be, it begins to bear on them. And they think, I, I, I just don't want to do a great deal right now. I just have to do just enough to just stay alive. Maybe you've been at that point somewhat. But in that instance, Barnabas said, I think there's more to him than just what others may look and see. God's got something more for him than what he can even see. And the truth is, Barnabas began to invest in John Mark again. And it's interesting because later on in scripture, Paul makes a statement. He says, Demas hath forsaken me, love this present world, having loved this present world. But could you send John Mark to me? For he is profitable for the ministry. Same guy that wrote this book. That had given up, quit, gone back home. Didn't know for sure if he had ever been in the ministry or anything else. But yet God used him to write scripture. And uh, Barnabas invested in him. He did some amazing work, even to the Apostle Paul, where he said, look, he's profitable for me. So just because today may be a struggle does not mean it's the end of the story. God's grace and mercy and ability is still well able to do what, is, what you need to do. So we see in, uh, in the book of Mark, the author of this book, the fact that everything that he begins to everything that he begins to write about has an element of servitude written into it. Because the, the truth is, John knew how to be a servant, and that's what he wanted to do. Since that was what he wanted to do, he wanted to make sure that, as the songwriter put it, when the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? That was a great deal of what the theme of Mark is. And uh, it pictures Jesus as a servant. And in that instance, he is asking us over and over again, how does the world see you and I? And in the verses that uh, we'll read this morning for here just a little bit, it's interesting to take note because in, in the instance where they're, they're going uh, and speaking here, there's an instance where the Lord is dealing with something. Now, I'm not going to have you stand. I'm going to hasten along here just a little bit. But I want you to notice, if you would, please, when we come to chapter number eight, look, if you would, please, in verse number 22. 
The Bible says, and, and he cometh to uh, Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. When he had uh, spit on his eyes and had put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes, made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. I think it's interesting because John Mark understands that sometimes you need that second touch. Sometimes you need the Lord to be gracious enough to come back to you again. And in that manner, we see here that even as he is writing about this very story, he is saying the Lord was real, did everything he was uh, intended to do. And when he asked the man how he saw, he said, I, I see men as trees walking. In other words, he says, everything is not clear. It's, it's kind of blurry for the most part. And we see as we come to uh, verse number uh, 25, after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored. And the Bible goes on to say, and saw every man clearly. I think it's kind of interesting because one of the first people then that that man saw was the Savior. One of the first people that he got to see, even though he had heard many voices, was the voice of him that basically had, uh, had restored him and had given him his sight back. The truth is, it's kind of interesting to take note because sometimes for you and I, we have the, as John the very instance and the very nature of who he was at some point was he got a little discouraged and he kind of set back just a little bit. In the process of setting back, the Lord had not forgotten him. By the way, the Lord has never forgotten you either. It doesn't matter where you're at in your walk with him. It doesn't matter where you're at as far as your relationship with God. He has not forgotten who you are. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows the wrestling match that you're going through. He knows the struggles that you face. He knows the difficulties that you're trying to manage right now. He knows the difficulties when you, uh, when you go to work that you have to face every day. He knows the difficulties that you face every morning when you wake up and the, the pain that racks your body. He understands those things. He knows the, the financial difficulties when you go to the bank and you, you need to write a, a check to pay a particular bill and, and you know that it's not exactly there just yet. He knows those things. I know, we, I know we think, well, Lord, why couldn't you just make a magical money appear right in there? Why could I, we've, we've all kind of thought those things. And by the way, he can if he so chooses. But he does it in a method that sometimes you and I don't think. The process to get that, oh, you're going to hate me for this, but here it comes. Scripture says, give and it shall be given. You say, I don't have enough now. I know. That's why you have to give. You say, that doesn't make sense. I know. God doesn't want it to make sense to you. He wants you to have faith. He doesn't want you to have logic. And, uh, but for, for some of us, we come to a point where we realize that sometimes this thankfulness for how God does things is just as much part of his character as, uh, as the fact that how we do things. Now, today's economy, it says this, you, you put it in an investment, we'll pay you interest and you'll get more back. You say, okay, that makes sense. Does it always happen? <laughs> Not this past year, huh? Anybody that has any investments, you have watched them as they have just begun to go tink, 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 tink. That's why after a while you stop looking at it. It's like, oh no, I can't look at this anymore. I can't do it. Reason being is because the temporal things of this earth are going to pass away. They will be consumed. They will, they will go away. And the truth is when you pass away, somebody's going to get it anyway. <laughs> you say, well, uh, 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 uh. You're just working hard for somebody else. That's all it is. I thought about that the other day and it's like, look, my wife is still young enough and pretty enough that if, that if I keel over, somebody else is going to marry her and then they're going to get everything I work for. By cracky, I'm quitting work. <laughs> and so uh, in that instance, it's one of those things where you begin to consider. It's like, huh. And so, uh, but nonetheless, you're, you, you invest in things and you plan on that. But you come to God and say, God, how are you going to take care of things? He said, I'll take care of you. You say, okay, well, how are you going to do it? He says, I'll tell you when I do it. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, how are you going to do it? Uh, I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to do it, but I'll tell you the method. Okay, what do I need to do? You need me to invest? Uh, no, I don't want you to invest. What do you want me to do? I want you to give it away. Uh, what? Yes, 
give and it shall be given to you. You'll begin to understand then how things are done because God says, I don't want it to make sense. I want you to have faith in who I am because the very first thing that he is mentioning in this verse right here is the very fact that this man all of a sudden begins to see something differently now. All of a sudden he begins to understand things differently now. He begins to perceive things differently now. The truth is, the question this morning for you and I is this. Can you see him or the Lord Jesus? Can you see Jesus in the person of who we are? In our operation and how we live and how we deal with our life, can you see the Lord? Can you see his working? Can you see the way that he does things? Sometimes we have to, anything that's done subconsciously first must first be done consciously. That means that we're going to have to change a little bit of how we think about things. So in other words, if, if I'm trying to gather things, for, <laughs> I, I, I've told you a story before. When I was, uh, uh, when I was a teenager, right before the uh, senior year of, of, uh, of my senior year, and uh, our, our house caught on fire. And uh, in the process of that, of course, I had been, I, just a little bit before that, uh, I had determined I'm going to live for me. Now, I'd already promised the Lord I'd do whatever he wanted me to do years before. But all of a sudden, I changed my mind because I wanted to start making those little green, pic, green pieces of paper with pictures of dead presidents and people on them. And I thought, that's going to be the, where I want to be. That's where I, what I want. And so I began to work towards that goal. And there's nothing wrong with working. Believe me, the Bible says that there's profit in all labor. Work is a good thing. I reminded somebody just the other day, and uh, he was talking about something, and I, and, uh, and I remembered uh, one fellow from college, the events that had taken place, and I told him, I said, look, work don't scare me. Work's not a bad thing to me. Work is a good thing. And, uh, and so it, it should be. We ought to teach our children that work is a good thing. It's profitable. It's beneficial. It, it's good for your character, for your dexterity. It'll also give you a kink in your back if you're not careful at times. But, uh, uh, but in that instance, it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. And you will be known by that. But how you see things is going to make a difference. And how people see you are, is going to be different. And in that instance, there comes a point where you have to ask yourself that very question that I mentioned even earlier. When the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? Now, the very first way that that's going to take place is if your, your thought processes and my thought processes turn to this. Being thankful. Being thankful. Now, I've got four things this morning, and I'll mention to you, but before we get to them, this is our Thanksgiving service. If we're going to do anything during this time of the year, there's one thing that we ought to make sure that we do. We need to voice our thankfulness to God. And it doesn't matter on what great thing or whether just a minute thing, just to let him know that he is thought about, appreciated, acknowledged, and by the way, scripture reminds us, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. You don't know the direction to go? Just tell God, God, I want you to know that you are part of every part of my life. And pretty soon, the pathway that you're supposed to go begins to reveal itself. You say, well, is it magic? No, it's just spirit led. That's just, that's just the way the scripture does it. That's the way God has promised it. And he'll do it for you too, because he makes it very clear. So during this time, I want you to stop and think for just a moment. We'll take some time to give testimony because we don't have to be in a hurry. I know Alan gets worried whether we're going to get out on time or not, but uh, we're going to get out when we get out is when we get out. And so, but uh, in that instance, uh, and, and let, me, let me say this, I'm thankful he's here. He could be anywhere else in the world, but he's here listening to the, the word of God. I'm grateful he's here. And in that instance, there may be some things that you and I need to say, Lord, I'm just, I'm thankful and let our heart turn towards that direction. Maybe you have a, a house that you live in, you should be thankful. Maybe you have the fact that, uh, uh, that Mrs. Whitworth reminded me of one of our first world problems just yesterday. We have so much food around this time, we don't know what to do with it all. I'm thankful. I read the missionary letters that they are grateful for just a, a few cans of whatever they can get as they try to gather some, uh, some resources and groceries and take to folks in, in outskirts of their towns that they're uh, they're struggling and when it gets cold like this they really struggle and I'm thinking we are doing well and I'm grateful and I turn to God and I say thank you and in that instance you and I as God's people we need to make sure that we let him know that we are thankful 
Scripture reminds us in everything, give thanks. I was reminded of that just the other night as we were driving through some very rough weather and uh, the roads were icy. There were people down in the ditch. There were fires going on. And uh, I drive, I have been driving past a, a turkey farm for, well, almost 18 years now. And uh, the other night I was getting ready to head back north and all of a sudden I saw a bunch of flashing lights. I didn't know if it was on the road and it happened to be part of that turkey farm that was right over there. And, uh, and as I drove past, I, uh, I said, Lord, I, I don't know who those people are. I've never met them in my life. I've seen the, the, the life that they've had there. I've seen the business that they've been trying to deal with. And God, there's nothing like losing everything in a fire. I know that. And I said, God, if you'll please take care of them, meet their needs. Because as I mentioned, my house caught on fire. And I can remember as I woke up my family, we began to run out the back door. I can still hear my mother, still hear dad, and I still hear things as they're going on. And it's a strange sound because oxygen is pulled out of there. And so there's this weird noise that takes place when you're inside a, a building that's on fire. It's difficult to breathe and the heat is intense. The crackling of things that's going on is, is odd beyond belief. You hear it on a little fire that we have at a, at a, uh, uh, maybe at a, a bonfire and things, but if you could imagine being engulfed in that to some degree, it's different. Out of all that time, I've been planning to live for me and what I was going to do and gather up money. And I, on the top drawer of my dresser, I had a great big wad of money that I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to put it in the bank. I wanted to be able to look at it. I had a rubber band around it right at the top of my drawer. As I was running out, I remember thinking that is in the top drawer of my dresser. And I thought, I've got to go get that. And I turned around to go get it. The heat was so intense and the oxygen so, so thin, I burned and singed the front of my hair as I was trying to get back in and, and, uh, and I couldn't get to it. I had to sit there and watch everything that I had been, <laughs> it's kind of funny because all my trophies metal, uh, melted, ran down the wall, had them on shelves, they all melted. Every little uh, uh, ribbon that I had that had a metal on it, had a bunch of them that was hanging there. All that nylon melted and the little metal dropped down to the floor. We found them a little later. And I was just reminded, those trophies are made of plastic. Yeah, you worked hard and you ran hard and you played hard to try to earn them. And nothing wrong with that. And, it, it, it's, it's, and I think you, you ought to try to uh, strive for something. But it was a reminder that everything of this life is very temporal the money that I was trying to save and the clothes that I had purchased and all those things went up in fire, in the fire. God had reminded me that night as I sat there and watched my house burn and as others gathered to watch it too. All the money that I'd been working for and I did, the second I turned 16, I went and found a job and I started working from day one. And even before that, I, I ran a paper out and did all those things. I, I tried to earn what I could. As I sat there and watched all of that, the Lord said, uh, what do you think? Now, can I honestly say that I was a little upset? I really was. Because I watched everything that I had been working for and living for as it was going up in smoke. And God reminded me of how temporal this life is. And told me that, for the most part, and he said, Son, if you'll work for me and the souls of men, they'll never burn. And so I just determined at that point right there, that my life has changed. All the money and things, God has supplied tremendous needs and he has done that graciously. Because I want when the world looks at me, my family, my life, the reputation, the people that, that I'm around, I want them to see the savior. I don't want them to see, well, he's just striving for money. No, that's not necessarily the goal. Is it necessary? Yeah, we have to pay bills. But is it the thing that I want my whole life to be remembered by? No, no not really. And John Mark was wanting to do that very thing that is here. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But I want to take some time and give you the opportunity just to do that very thing that we all should do. During this Thanksgiving time is just to be thankful. Now, I, I don't know who, who wants to go first. It doesn't make me any difference. But we'll just take a, a few minutes. And, uh, but I think that we ought to take some time to just say, Lord, I am grateful for, and you can make a big list. We had friends that started off at the beginning of the year and just page after page because they, they didn't want to miss the fact that God was involved in their life and all the way from a loaf of bread that was given to shoes that was given to children. I mean, I remember some of the lists that was there as strange as it seems. 
And as strange as that seemed, <laughs> but, but in that instance, thankful and grateful. So let's take some time, just take a few minutes, and, and I promise I'll, I'll get to the, the message that is here this morning. Brother Ted, go ahead. Let's go next. Go ahead, Miss Becky. give thanks. Anybody else? Go ahead, Brother Caleb. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Go ahead, Brother Stark. Yeah, that's right. When you consider God's blessings, sometimes the tri trifle things just seem insignificant. They just do. Anybody else? Okay. Five. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. 
right. We'll take just another minute or two. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, sir.
That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Anyone else right before we finish up here a little bit? Yes, ma'am. He does. Amen. Amen. Anyone else right before we? Five, four, three, two. It is a reminder, as Mrs. Whitworth said, our grandchildren were singing Jesus Loves Me. But as simple as that seems, how would your life be different had you made a decision differently decades ago? Where would your life have turned had you not turned towards the Lord? Where would it be if you had followed that dream of just that temporal of gathering of a few things? Where would your family, where would your children, where would things be today? It is just a reminder to that very thing. Can you see him? Can you see the Lord? When the world looks at you and I, do they see our Lord? Let me give you just a, four things as I mentioned. Number one, can they see him in the belief of your heart? Can they see the Lord Jesus in the belief of your heart? You see, Job chapter number 19 and verse number 29 or 25 reminds us of this. As Job and the difficulties that he faced, 10 caskets, every one of them, the face of his child. All of his security, all of his wealth, everything that he had was completely gone. His body was wrecked with pain now and he could not go anywhere he had no resources he had no he had no family he had nothing but yet this was his statement I know that my redeemer liveth if there is one thing that you and I have we have hope we do our ability to be thankful t uh, hinges on the fact that we always have hope we really do uh, for the most part we're always hoping that tomorrow may be better than today and uh, and we're always hoping that tomorrow can be a little bit more gracious and merciful. We're hoping the Lord gives us the grace that we need and the mercy that is necessary to continue on to make an impact to do something for him in the belief of your heart. Job made it very clear even to his friends and those around, those around him as he made statement uh, like this, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That was a belief of his heart. And when his friends come and began to encourage him, and their encouragement was not very encouraging. It really wasn't. They literally turned around and said, well, it's your fault that this happened to you. It's because you've sinned that this happened to you. And, it's because, and uh, they were not very good encouragement. But he turned around to them and reminded them, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Now, I may be facing some difficulties today, but I know he lives. And when the friends looked back at him, he even had to tell them, you guys are, are very poor encouragers. And in that manner, he is reminding them of this. I know that things go wrong. I know that sometimes things turn south. I know that sometimes, but I'll tell you this. Naked came I into this world and naked I shall return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He made it very clear that he believed and the belief of his heart made an impact and allowed the people to see him and, uh, and to see their Lord. Not only that, I, I like the way Paul put it in 2 Timothy where he said, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able and he makes it very clear that the belief of his heart is this. I'm not a whole lot to look at. I don't have a whole lot of talent. I don't have a whole lot of ability. But if there's one thing this world can do, when they look at me, they can see the Lord. And they can, uh, they can hear about him, the belief of your heart. Number two, can they see him? Can the world see him in the words of your lips? Number two, can the world see him, see our Lord in the words of your lips? 
Matthew chapter number 26 reminds us that even during that time of denial, when the Lord now was getting ready to face persecution and eventually go to the cross, Peter was warming his hands. And all of a sudden they said, weren't you with Jesus? And he said, no, I wasn't with him. Somebody else came up and said, no, 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 I think you were with him. And he said, no, I wasn't. And pretty soon somebody came up and said, your speech has given you away. You talk just like him. And pretty soon he had to then change the way he was talking and actually curse and swear. So the question comes this, can the world see our Lord through the words of your lips? I think it's kind of interesting when you, when, when you uh, are scanning things and all of a sudden the cashier says, oh, looks like uh, you get a discount today. Do you say, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> you say, well, I, I don't and uh, oftentimes, it doesn't matter. I've told you before, I, if I see a penny on the ground, I'll pick it up and I say out loud, I love you too, Lord. It doesn't matter who's around. It really doesn't. It does, you say, well, aren't you embarrassed? No, not in the least bit. I'm just not. But it comes a point, it's like saying, are, are you embarrassed of other things? Well, I, look, <laughs> I, I know. Look, I've, I can look in the mirror in the morning. I know how goofy looking I am. I know that. I can see it all the time. It makes me laugh. It's like, man, I'm sorry. The whole world has to look at you. I really am. But when they look at me, I want them to see the Lord. The songs that, that I sing, sometimes I, you, know, you never know what, what's going to happen. I never know what's for sure going to come out of my mouth when I start singing sometimes. But uh, in that instance, it is uh, the occasion. Somebody the other day, I, I needed to get up and reach one of the, uh, the load bars that were up in the top of the trailer. And I asked a, one of the kids that were there, I said, hey, come over here and help me for a second. I said, I need to, need to reach that bar. Can you, uh, I'll, I'll stand on the forks if you'll just pick me up. And so he's coming over, he drives over there. So I start singing. You raised me up so I could reach the load bar. You, you know, and it's like, oh, you're just nuts. And it's like, yeah, I am. And I'll be, I'll be driving down the, 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 the way on a forklift there just singing, I'd rather be an old-time Christian than anything I know. I, you know, people just shake their head. And it's just, if, if they're going to play the world's music across the speakers, guess what? I can sing the Lord's music anytime I want to. And uh, so the words of your lips. Is it kindness that you're expressing? Is it the, the favor of the Lord? Is it the Lord's uh, words that you are giving out at some times? Look, this world has plenty of criticism. They have plenty of things that could, that could get you to say things that are ornery. But maybe the words of your lips will convey who he is and how much he means to you. Can you see him in the belief of your heart? Can you see him in the words of your lips? Number three, number, uh, number three can you see him in the actions of your hands? The task that you put your hand to do, the things that you do, is it to help others? Is it to try to be a, a help, an encouragement, and a motivation? Try to ease the burden of somebody else in that manner, the action of your hands? Or is it easy for the devil to find something for your hands to do? Is it easy for it to use your hands for something that should not be done? And, and let me remind all of us, uh, the scripture talks about taking things that are not yours doing things that you should not do. Even the, the little songs that we sing in Sunday school class, oh, be careful little eyes what you see, oh, be careful little hands what you do. There's a father up above who is looking down in love, oh, be careful little hands what you do. In that manner, it is reminding us of this. God has given us abilities, talents, and skills to some degree. Can we use them for him? Can we use them to encourage somebody else? The other day, I, plenty of people, I have right now a, a cake underneath my, uh, the pulpit here that somebody gave me for my birthday. And, uh, and in that instance, I think, you know, they had to work to earn the money. And while they were earning that money, they used some of that because they remembered their preacher. And it humbles me. And so as I go through and I eat some of those things, I always pray for their family and uh, just ask God to take care of their future, their finances, their family. I do it every single time. The other night, uh, Miss Donna, so graciously, she, she bakes. And for the most part, she bakes to give it away. She really does. And uh, she gives uh, just t tons and tons of things away to family member friends. The other day she had given me some pumpkin cookies and, and I, I like pumpkin stuff, I just do. And, uh, and I was eating that cookie and I began to taste it instead of just, now I was balancing it out with coffee, don't worry. And, uh, but as I ate that, I, I tasted the different types of nuts that were in it and the spices and different things. And I thought somebody had to take time and money and effort to put this all together. And I was looking at that and I'm thinking, if I was to buy this cookie, it would cost a lot of money, but it was given to me just out of love. 
because this is a way that somebody can express their love for their preacher. And in that instance, of course, I pray for family and things like that. This morning as I pulled up and the bus had already gone, but I saw the other cars that were there, I, I knew that somebody had gotten here early to make sure that bus was running. I knew that there were people that had already visited and gotten on that bus today to go and pick up young people so they could hear the gospel. And I said, Lord, thank you. Thankful that the bus started. Thankful for the person that drove it. Thankful for the workers that, that visit and get the young people here so they can hear things that they may not hear if they did not come. Thankful for the people in this morning as you begin to come in. I, I was sitting here and though I couldn't get up and run as easily as I had at other times to shake hands and things of that nature. I remembered the lights that were on and how things are, are taken. And I said, Lord, these, these dear folks have worked this week. They have given so we could have the lights on, so that we could run the buses, so that we could reach the, around the world uh, with the, the ministry of Faith Baptist Church with the gospel. I said, Lord, thank you for the actions of their hands that they're willing to give and be thankful and do your work and your will. Thank you. Then lastly, can you see him in the truth of your life? In the truth of your life. Your life is expressing something. Your life is telling a story. Your life is conveying what has been invested and given to you. And in that manner, your life now is an expression of all the investments that others have made. I've told you this story before. Now they're in heaven now. I had a Sunday school teacher named Maudie Preston. Maudie was very small like Mrs. Johnston. But she had a Sunday school class and she was very crafty in how she did things. We had some of the most amazing things that we would make in Sunday school class. Her husband would, was one of the ushers that I always wanted to sit on the row where he was collecting the offering because he had juicy fruit gum in his pocket. And I knew if I put something in the offering, he'd give me a stick of juicy fruit gum. And, uh, and in that instance, I, I just remember all of those people that invested, all the people that got up early and did what was necessary to make sure that the church building stayed open so I could go to church, so I could hear the gospel so that I would have trust Christ as Savior, so that God could work in my heart. And the truth of their life was the fact that they wanted the investment, the air that they breathed, and the resources that they gathered to be given for the Lord's sake. And I am here a product of somebody else's giving. I am standing here because somebody else's willingness to carry the baton. And in that instance, can you see him in the life that he lived? Heaven is going to be a great deal of just us saying, thank you for this, this, and we'll have millions of years to do it. And by the way, it'll never get boring. You'll be surprised on things. I, I, I can't wait to get there. Now, I, hopefully I'm, I'm going to wait, but I can't wait to get there. But in that instance, question this morning is this. Can you see the Lord in your life? Does others see him? As the songwriter put it, when the world looks at me, do they see Jesus? When the world looks at me, what do they see? Do they see life? Do they see hope? Do they see charity? When the world looks at me, what do they see? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. And God, it all begins with a transaction that takes place that you've made it very simple. You said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The way that anything begins, Lord, is going to be by putting your faith and trust in you. Father, you remind us that we're all sinners and there is a price on sin, but Jesus paid that price and all we have to do by faith is trust him. It's not a single thing physically that we can do. It's got to be trust. God, I do ask that you please help us now to do your will. Now, with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed this morning, the first question is this. Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven today? Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? February 23rd, 1981, when I trusted Christ as Savior, I have never doubted, not one iota, that anything other than I'm going to heaven when I, buy, when I die, when I pass, or when the Lord comes. I know that. I know people logically want me to explain it, but I, I can't explain faith. But it's more real than anything tangibly that you can hold. Even Hebrew says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. In that instance, do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? If not, I'd love to take a Bible and show you exactly what it means to trust Christ as Savior. You don't have to leave today not knowing. You can know that for sure. 
Scripture says that you can. But the next question is this. You say, Brother Whitworth, I've trusted Christ as Savior. I know that. Maybe the question comes this morning. When the world looks at you and I, what do they see? Do they see character, discipline, and a love for the Savior? Do they see something that is going to be attractive in that manner? If not, then the question this morning is, what needs to be adjusted? What can the Lord do to make it more appealing? What can you do to surrender? The question is, in, is for you, because he's done everything that he can do, but he's willing to give you strength, power, and encouragement to do what you can do. Have you trusted Christ as Savior? Do people see him in you? That's the question this morning. In just a second, we're going to stand with our heads bound, with our eyes closed. The altar will be open. There'll be people coming to pray. If you do not know for sure that you're on your way to heaven, I'd love to take a Bible and show you exactly what that means. Or maybe you just want to come and kneel and pray and say, God, please help me to be the person I should be for your sake. I, I, maybe, I've, maybe I've struggled. Maybe I've, I've stumbled. But God, would you please help me? He's interested in you. He's interested in helping. And he will help. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. As the instrument begins to play, if God's spoken to your heart, the altar's open. You may come.